Top 50 Designers in America by Designers Today. So sometimes people ask when, when I go to market, like, what are you looking at? What are you looking for? And, you know, we, we say sometimes we come in with a, a few ideas of what we think is going to be out there, and sometimes we just leave it open to, you know, discovery. Um, but I think the question that these um, experts can address better than I can is, what's a trend? What's a fad? What's timeless design? How do you distinguish between them? And how do you use them in your business? So who wants to start with a definition? Well, I'll do real quick. Is that, that, that lays in. That's she, an she easy taught, one. That's she, a soft spot for me. She taught me this definition. I carried it forward. So, so there's, there's a couple things I do when I'm working with clients all over the world, the first thing that I say is, I think of it linear, in a linear way. The word trend means the direction in which things will tend to move. So all of us are always paying attention to that, whether it's intentionally, whether it's consciously, whether it's subconsciously, right? How are things moving forward? How are we looking fresh? How are things changing? So we think of trends in a horizontal line, things that have this longevity that are moving this way. We think of fads in a vertical line. It's gonna go up and down really quickly. Um, most people don't have a lot of space to play because they, they go up, they're so fickle, they go up and down very quickly. Um, in terms of a real definition of, of, of trend, I'll leave it at that, I'll talk about spent later. But that's really, I think, at the basis of what is a trend versus a fad. Do you all agree or do you have? Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a great way to think about it, mm -hmm. to see that, that graph. I, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. this way. I told you this way. she taught yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I graduated. <laughs> I was a graduate. Um, so, what makes a trend? How would you, um, when you're when you're out there looking at things, what influences a trend? What feeds into a trend? What outside influences play into that? I'm, I'll take that one to start. Um, for me, what I'm always looking for, a trend is something that I think is going to have longevity. And it's because it's based on an intellectual platform of some sort. There's a movement like sustainability or artisan maker. And so it's, there's a bigger intellectual construct that a trend can tie into. And if it does, then it has longevity. And it can have a lot more significance. Um, outdoor living is an example. I've been in the business for 30 years. Outdoor living used to be very limited. There were not a lot of products. And then suddenly we had all these great products, luxurious products, um, and lighting. The shift in outdoor lighting was absolutely remarkable. So I saw that emerging and I thought, oh my God, this is exciting because I do rooftop bars and I do lojos and pool areas. And I thought, this is a game changer. And now I see that with um, rechargeable lighting. Yeah, and, and, I just and, mention that. Okay, so, so many design solutions. That's going to have legs and legs and legs and legs. Exactly. So I look for something that we need culturally, functionally, and if a product is responding to that, I know that it's going to be more than fad. It's going to be a trend, yes. and it may be a part of the movement. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's now, true. now I'll put spin okay. in real quick. And then I'll let you well, know. No, I <laughs> wanted to, chal I wanted oh, to challenge this. Oh, yeah. challenge yeah. that first. Yeah. Yeah. You, you describe technology or piece of furniture. I've done outdoor for thirty-five years in yes. California. Yeah. So, what is the trend piece of that, though? Is it a finish you see, or is it because you yeah. the technology you describe? Sure. But because sure, sure. I remember the first outdoor lights were those huge things yes, that were yes, by yes. valets. Mm -hmm. So, how do you see like the, the way trend I piece saw it shift was more luxurious fabrics, um, particularly someone like Janice AC. I started seeing, I said, this can't be outdoor, or Elaine mm -hmm. Smith, those pillows that are impossibly mm -hmm. outdoors, she okay. says. Those kinds of things. And then seeing lamps that I thought, well, that looks like an interior lamp, but then you can create beautiful scenery. And so it sort of took the aesthetic that we loved and made right. it possible outdoors. Being in California, you guys were so yeah, far ahead yeah, with yeah, outdoor yeah, yeah. On the East Coast, we didn't think that way as much. But then these products, I think, motivated us to start seeing out their spaces. It's, well, yeah. it's, it's a combination of both of what you're both, for me, of what you're both saying. It always exists in California because of the climate. But in terms of the trend that we saw happen with outdoor, as we approached um, the pandemic, we were already on the beginning of that trend. But going through the pandemic allowed us yeah. this 
this need for a space that we could escape to. And to build on your question about how did it change, it became more decor inspired. So the fabrics got better. Yeah. Umbrellas did these, all these incredible fabrics that don't feel like outdoor fabrics. You see these outdoor, yesterday I saw this beautiful outdoor bouquet at yeah. Kravit, and it was like, oh my God, you know, this looks like something that would be an interior yeah. fabric, and then it's an exterior fabric. So it's this idea of being more decor inspired because people were expanding their space to, and they wanted the same aesthetic that they had in their own aesthetic, and they were bringing it now to a larger space and with new materials. And but similar, you know, you've got a gorgeous swivel bucket chair, you know, and all the things that used to be very kind of stationary and outdoor, right? All those kinds of things started to play. But I wanted to build on what you said, and then I want you to talk because I don't feel. But the, the the five things that we look at when we talk about how you're doing this is social, which you just talked about a little bit. So we call, we coined the acronym SPIT. So the S stands for social, and those are some of the impacts that we're looking for in terms of what's impacting us as, as humans. And so not us, not just our customers, because we are also consumers ourselves, right? So what are we looking for? So it's social, and that can be art, that can be pop culture, that can be music, all the things that happen under the social umbrella. The P is for political. We certainly see a difference in the climate and what people are willing to spend money on, what people are willing to do um, when there's a very you know, heavily charged political timing. Um, the E is for economic. We certainly see a lot of difference in what we want to, what we feel comfortable spending money on, what our clients feel comfortable spending money on when there's high inflation, when there's interest rates that are changing, etc. So that's the economic portion. We also see the impact of when there's a war over there, how does it impact what happens to us over here? What goes up, what goes down in our own climate? Then the N is for nature. Certainly that outdoor living was a huge um, explosion under that umbrella. Even louder? Yeah. I have a big mouth. Well, oh, I'm you're sorry. Talking, you're doing well, well, but the gentlemen need to follow your trend. Oh, I'm, I'm, used, I'm used to projecting. And then the end is nature. And then the T is technology, which then goes to like the portable lamps. And how, do, how does technology help make our lives easier, yeah. smarter, you know, be, um, and safer, if you will. And so LED, the advent of LED also helped outdoor living in terms of what you're talking about because it could stand alone. The materials could change in terms of what you could use to create a light. You know, all those things happen. You, so that's it. And you triggered something now that you're talking about. I'm like, wait, we did triple glazed windows came mm -hmm. in. It was the heaters built in. Mm -hmm. So it pushed in different climates. Absolutely. So exactly. there's more of a demand, yes. too, which allowed more creativity. How's that for a West Coast yeah. person? Yeah. There you go. Well, I think that socially, like just the interaction with people, people that here in the showroom, we started noticing that they were asking for certain fabrics and certain types of, uh, you know, uh, designs that we, at the time, just never really gave it any kind of importance because there was not enough of it. And now that the materials have kind of caught up, I think, mm -hmm. to what people really wanted, what how they wanted to express themselves and how they wanted to share their experiences with their families and you know, just and it wasn't just really a pandemic that brought that all. No, on. but it, it was, was it, 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 definitely, it, it definitely it shot it out yes, through the exactly, roof. Exactly. But I think the need was there from the beginning, mm -hmm. and so now suddenly the industry always is lacking a little bit of what we want. Mm -hmm. Like they they're just sitting back there waiting until we can kind of say, you know, I really would like to open up my patio doors and have the nice furniture that I have inside, outside, and I want to have better lighting outside than I have inside. So now suddenly it all picked up. And well, one, as a manufacturer, we have to really pay attention to that and we have to start stepping up our game. Thankfully, material started to become available. So now the big challenge is what do we design that <coughs> the general public wants and how do we offer this to our buyers and say, well, now this is how you present it. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to know that people would buy it, but we're not getting the public in. The consumers aren't coming in here. But now here are these buyers, and they're sort of struggling because they're trying to figure out, well, how do I present that in my store? What do I do? How, how can I express that emotion, that feeling, with the displays, with the vignettes? How do I get this all pulled together? And the best thing that we could do is listen to all of you buyers and all your designers because we could inspire you. We can try to kind of influence you as this is what our trend is and what this is going forward. This could be what you could present and build your business. So that's 
we're looking at it from a mood standpoint. I mean, it just finally the mood is kind of shifted and everybody wants it, everybody feels like that's what they want, but they don't know how to kind of pull it all together. Yeah. So you just mentioned mood and how you just talked about social, the sense of the human element. What impact, if any, does social media have on design direction? Oh, huge. Oh, well, and well, it's interesting being on this panel because I do very luxury. I do six and seven figure kitchens and bathrooms. So part of it too is my clients don't want trends sometimes. They don't want it. They want different. That's the artistry in this. But then we have to worry, okay, what do I do then that's going to last over these years? I recommend for people that want to kind of watch is high-end designers. We get bored with stuff. We're always looking for like, okay, what's different? Like we use this chiseled limestone I loved. Well, the third client picked it, we threw it away. It's like we're never using that again because <laughs> we have to photograph it. So that's one thing I've used social media to watch what the high-end designers are like doing a little crazier with a pattern or a material. and. Um, you know, for product, for me, I get sales reports. Um, and so I'm seeing satin bronze is passing satin brass in the plumbing world. But is it too early? Is the public gonna take it? They still, satin brass is still yeah. satin brass. So yeah. it, it will come, yeah. but when is it gonna be it? Like satin brass, when is, it's the timing sometimes mm -hmm. on certain things. Mm -hmm. Or I'll have another piece that Matt Black is still the number one seller mm -hmm. in that piece. So. Yeah. Um, well, it also has to do with, to your point of the level of market, because you have the early adapters, which are where those, you know, top designers are, those are the people that are driving it, those are the people that are, are stuck, trying to stay out front, then they have to stay different, and they have to stay ahead of the curve. Um, then you have those that are, need to see it a few times before it feels comfortable to them, so that's why you're going to have it a different level, a different color, or a different direction that might be, have more, more impact right now. And then you have those that, uh, you know, would be more what would be in the mass market, which would be the next ones where they've got to see it for a time, but they also have to wait for it to get down to their price point. Right. You know, because when they first come out, when things first come out, they tend to be at that higher level, right? So they tend to be not as obtainable. It's still the formula to trickle down. Yes, absolutely. Still still still, I mean, I think a lot of information comes at the same time, but in terms of how it's implemented, because of the mindset of the people who it's going to, um, that's driving, so, like you said, the customer's sort of driving it. Like you were telling me the other day, you have all this gorgeous color on the wall, and one of these big buying groups came in and wanted all this in beige. Can you believe that? With all this gorgeous color, and they're asking for it in beige. He answers, and Brian told me that, and I'm like, what? You know, of all the places where you can actually bring a pop of color, this is where you're not taking a big chance at a pop of color, and you want beige? <laughs> you know? I completely understand about social media and how it can promote all of us and our careers and our business. I, I totally get all of that. I just look at a lot of what I see, and I just see. God, there's a lot of just trash out there. And, and how do you weed through all of that? And how do you understand really what is the trend? What is timeless? You have to actually ask yourself and look at this and say, you know, yes, this that is, you know, this chartreuse wall and, and you know, flamingo wallpaper on the ceiling, that might fit that person, but, you know, it, it, you just have to ask yourself questions. Yeah. And I think that social media definitely could help. I mean, I'm not of the age group that I had social media growing up, so I'm like, it's, it's definitely different for me. Um, but I'm seeing and listening to the young people that now tell me that this is what has to happen. And yeah, I get it. It's just, I feel like there's just so much bombarded at all. You know, and where do we really understand what is good, what's bad, and and how do we invest in the different items that we're compiling to be our home, to be our trend, to be our lifestyle? How are we compiling that? And, you know, I, I remember the age when it was, you know, I went to Ikea and I bought a bunch of furniture because I needed furniture and then suddenly that was out on the curbside and I'm buying now French antiques and I'm, I've, I live a different way. 
and we grow as we go on, but I mean, I think that social media has just been that, sort of that thing that you have to navigate. Like you have to kind of understand not everything is going to be for you. Not, every, not discern, everything is discern, good. Discern, not discern, everything discern, is discern, good. Discern. For sure. <laughs> Most things aren't. Yeah. One, well, one of the things yeah. I've noticed about social media, because I agree with what you just said, is that um, there's an oversaturation. I call it visual fatigue. Yes. Something that I might love. And as an example, a few years ago, ECAT was everywhere. And I mm -hmm. love ECAT. It's a great mm -hmm. historic pattern. But suddenly I'm walking from High Point Market mm -hmm. and it's on the napkins mm -hmm. and it's on the tabletop and it's on the sofa. And it's just visual overload and social media has this power because it circles, it circles, it circles yes. globally so quickly. And you're like, okay, I, I need a break from, mm -hmm. from ECAP right. for a while. But See, you are seeing it because you're on this side. Because I'm on this but side. But your customer yeah, has exactly. not seen nearly as much of it as you have exactly. because you're seeing it on the product that hasn't even made it into a store. Yeah, and I think so about getting and that is also what you have to, you have yeah. to, some to of, be into. Some of it has, but I think it's regional too. Mm -hmm. There's parts of the country that this has taken off and it's regional. And But yes, we're privy to it here. But then it becomes so much of it. It's yeah. just like, it was like new clay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I had done new clay 12 <laughs> years ago. And if I had seen one more page, oh, no. great new clay. Same age, but what, new clay. But when I talk about it, what I like at these shows, it was like Saru's wood. I've done it yeah. custom furniture. All of a sudden you start seeing these things. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not, you're not talking to them down the hall and yeah. over there. Yeah. And it's just these it's a a movement. It's a it's a but that's that same thing. It's what's out in the world that we're all being influenced by. And you land in these buckets and it is it is the way of the world. And then there's the cyclical aspect to it that it's been, you know, now things are coming around that we've all seen before. But it's new to the younger, you know, the younger client. So they may be asking for something and go, oh my God, you want that? But it's because it's new to them. It's fresh to them and it shouldn't come back the way it was when we saw it the first time please right. you know it really needs to be enhanced and touched and schmoozed and played with yeah. to create and make it fresh and new for now um, I but, never uh, avoid so. the, the hot new thing mm -hmm. I never avoid that I, I learn it I listen to it I, I analyze it but I find comfort in the past <laughs> I find <laughs> comfort looking and it could be when i say past it doesn't have to be 18th century antiques it could be literally it could be something that was in the 70s and 80s that i that i thought at the time probably was oh shit i'll never have that um, i will never want to have that but now i'm revisiting all of that and i'm using what i'm seeing is the new hot thing the new the you know the new colors the new fabrics the everything and i'm saying to myself well, what if I go back to the past and I and I interpret it differently? Yeah, that's what it should be. And then, question was to me in France was, when you look at an antique or it, you know a, a 1970s leather armchair out of Italy, and you, they say, well, are you going to redo this? Are you going to reproduce this? And I say, but. Um, I've already created a 20-piece collection off of that chair. In my head, I don't have to recreate or reproduce something. I, I am... You build on it. You build yeah. on it. Yes. And I think that's where we yes. kind of start setting our own our own books, our own trends. And, and, that, I, and I get it when we come to market. That's a big topic. Yeah. Well, you know, people come in here. Well, what's a trend? Mm -hmm. What do you see? I see a lot in my head. Um, <laughs> but we don't want to talk about all those. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I can't always tell that story. But uh, where's Brian? Uh, uh, he's there. Uh, he's uh, uh, yeah, it, it, I think there is a balance, and that's a big thing with me. It's it, the word balance. You know, our our careers and our world, it's a lot of out of balance. And I think we gotta find balance in a lot of those things that we're using as, you know, innovations and, and but, inspirations. Uh, so will your, will the customers, because you're picturing these things, you've got, some of them are very original, so it's maybe too far ahead to talk to customers? Yes. Or how do you, how do you rein it in where it's gonna sell? 
Yeah. If anybody ever hired me and said, well, I would like to have you in my showroom, I'd really like for you to sell, I would probably cringe and they would probably fire me after the first day because I don't sell. I listen, I talk. If any of you guys have ever been in the showroom and listened to me, I will ask you like a hundred questions I want to know about what is your business, what do you do, where's your clients, what are they buying, uh, where are you going on vacation, you know, what's your influences, because all of that really starts to create in my head what I could create for you. Because if I don't know what your business is all about, how can I possibly create something and say, hey, I think you need to go and buy that and sell that? How do I know that? So I, I, that's a big part of me being in the show, is talking to people and, I mean, I meet the most unbelievable people and I, we share a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> so that's, that's my take on how do I, from having all those ideas, and how does it interpret into maybe a trend or not a fad? I hate that word fad. Mm -hmm. It I seems like, like fad is a bad word. It yeah, does. It doesn't have to be a bad word, but in home decor, things have longevity because they're gonna. You're not putting fads in your house. What's an just, example of a recent fad for yeah, you? It's a What's fad a recent in fad? home decor or yeah. fad in general? In general, to give them both. Oh no, God. What's a fad in general? What? He can't. Oh, yeah. 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 No, yeah. Yeah. no, because it's not as beautiful and I just came, I just came back to told us the, the color of the earth was going to be orchid. Oh, there God. were like two accent walls in High Point Market and orchid. But nothing was really but ever orchid. Really, yeah. It was always, we have a magenta, we have a purple, we have yeah, a whatever's yeah, the closest yeah. to that color range that they would push over their rectum. Exactly. They would go, we have, we have, it's like, no, 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 no. Um, that's a good question. Let me think about that. Um, well, that's true. Bar Brian saying Barbie Pink. Yeah, yeah Barbie, Barbie Pink definitely Sir, was. Sir Williams picked the pink. Yes, yeah, but Barbie Pink certainly sure. was a fad because it was never anything that was meant to be in the home. No one should have had anything in a Barbie Pink color except <laughs> little, maybe, you know, certain people with their little girls' <coughs> rooms who were into princesses. But otherwise, there should never really have been anything that was a Barbie Pink. Except um, for a tray. <laughs> <laughs> Even that's not Barbie Pink. That's much more elegant and We're calling it Barbie I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to push product. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, there's a that part. would be a good one. <laughs> that whole Barbie thing was definitely that whole idea. And it's interesting when we talk about social as a as a driver and and, so, and social media. Like right now, we'll use another one, Brat, the color Brat that is the lime green color that that um, Charlie's as, what is it, XES? I'm not terrible. Um, put out and then she called Kamala Harris Brat, but it's this lime green color that was the color of the summer. And that was definitely a fad. No one, you know, no one over a certain age really needed to have that color in any kind of magnitude. However, yeah. we do have a color. Not except for in a tray. Well, there you go. In a tray, it would be beautiful. That's why I said magnitude. Coming, Coming out in 2025. Right there. But we did come out with a color in our forecast that we called Citron Press. And we saw a lot of that lime, citrusy green in Milan in April. It was everywhere. And so it is good for a pillow you know, or something that's a, a beautiful tray, a pop of color, but it's not something that you're going to want to have forever, and so that would ultimately be a fad. I think what you just mentioned, investment, because I do boutique hotels, and, and we're cycling on a five to seven year time frame, so I, when I'm thinking about the design, I have to think about how do I give them something that feels current and relevant, but it also has to have staying power. Because we're not going to replicate it every year or every two years. It's going to have to live for five exactly. years. Five to, seven. Uh, five to seven years. And so what I like to do is invest for the big pieces in things that are more stable. So, you know, we, we laugh oh, at yeah. beige. Mm -hmm. But if you, ask, beige, you if you ask upholstery companies here at market what colors sell the best, there's going to be beige, tote, gray, those, exactly. those sort of neutral colors. And yeah. now we've got those wonderful warm brown. Yeah. Um, so, you tend to think that way if you're trying to be a good steward of your client's resources and you want them to love you for 20 plus years. And you take really great- the next house and the next house exactly. and the next house. Exactly. <laughs> but then do some really fabulous trays exactly. and do really beautiful, luxurious throws because I look at work like Christopher's and I think, how can I bring that to the hospitality sector? Because I'm not spending the level of money that, that Chris is uh, because hotels just don't do that. Anymore. But I can create that feeling. Right. 
um, and that look. Yeah. By being, by being smart right. and listening to you, <laughs> and looking at what's happening in fashion, right. you know, yeah. there's there's a way to find that balance. There is, and that's what it should always be. And we talk about that with our clients. There are things that we call a base color, and then there's yeah. things we call accent colors, and that's how you bring the new, the fresh. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. Christopher, you work a lot in kitchen and bath. So what do you see going on there that you feel? I know we talked a little bit earlier before we got started about people staying in their lanes and keeping yeah. these different industries so separate, but how do you see it is, that? It's been interesting. I actually, we're working together. I'm doing a line for Howard Elliott. Come back in April to look at it. It's very funny. Um, it's, it's really fascinating, like trend forecasting. I get called that. But I look for things that are like the kitchen bath. It's like that's weird mm -hmm. because you haven't seen this is going back years. Satin breasts. Mm -hmm. There's like one little display, and then the next year, and the next year. So I'm watching for that. The challenge I also have: client doesn't want trends, but what am I designing that doesn't look like it went out of style in four weeks? Yes. You know what I mean? So there's things that are split finishes, um, just. Classic. I'm very good at the classic details. I'm actually redoing a kitchen I did up in the Bay Area, and it still has a cherry stain and stuff. I'm like, God, it's held up really well. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's certain things with the longevity because the investment in a kitchen is expensive. So how do you put these accents in, and then how do you use other accents this way? But it's a blending a lot of times that I'm doing. If split finishes or different woods right now. I mean, that was a trend. I got interviewed in January about what's a trend. Customization. Yeah. Oh, that's a trend. Yeah. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. not a color. It's not a finish. It was just the capabilities. It's like what Brian does. You want it customized. It's individual. That to me had become a trend. Oh, absolutely. Across the board. Personalization, customization. But it's going to stick yeah. because designers get the opportunity to create for right. our clients. Right. So. And the other thing that's interesting when you're doing kitchen and bath, I just was at a, a conference a couple of weeks ago, and there was a gentleman that was was doing a lot of the data points for what's going on in home sales and all of that. And of course, as they talk about people being nervous about interest rates and being nervous about inflation. Of course, the kitchen and bath on all his charts were the areas where people, A, they're staying in their homes longer, data point, and B, the things that they change when they're in their homes longer, so of course, is kitchen and bath. And so they're talking a great deal about the size and scale of kitchens and bath, which have gotten bigger and are now coming in as the size of homes are coming in. So you start to think about longevity, if I'm gonna be someplace, after a certain amount of time, my kitchen is where I'm going to spend some money. My baths are, you know, baths are where you're going to spend some money. So how do you keep those fresh, but able to last for a certain amount of time until it's time to refresh? Well, it also goes into to resale mm -hmm. because that's the room that makes it. Mm -hmm. Then there's also the customer that has spent that much money and thinks this is going to sell my house, right. and the next person comes in and whips, whips it all, it all out. out. <laughs> so you, exactly. keep, you know, but how do you make it? <coughs> work and that's part of it I try to watch for little like white kitchens about 18 years ago I'll right. say I had the third high-end client ask for a white bathroom or a white kitchen and I had a bath vanity line with modern bathroom and I went to them and said you need to do white they thought I was bonkers <laughs> became their number one seller. Then I'm going back and like, you need to do gray. Well, that was kitchen based. That was not in this world yet. And so there's pieces like that. Watch for what's different. Mm -hmm. And like, I love this copper color. It's this yeah, warm, we're talking about and now. I it's don't, it's, it's yeah. one of those though, is that color gonna take off? But I'm using it as an accent on some lighting I'm doing, you know? Yeah. And so it's a way that I'm using it to express a unique color because I'm not sure if it's gonna it's like Copper rose, is big in Europe. <laughs> rose big gold in Europe right now. Rose Definitely gold was well, huge in Europe. Well it's and, the whole range of that from copper to rose gold, anything on that side of the palette. But when I kept getting asked, is it going to take off in the States? And 60% of iPhones were rose gold, the sales of them. So we as Americans bought accents of it. Europe, I remember Athens Airport, the furniture, the metal, everything. It's gorgeous. So um, I get to use that part of 
my world to see and then carry it over to other things. You mentioned something that's interesting though. You said you see something that stands out that's different and you guys are experts at this, but it's curious, like how do you know if something's like you're really on to something or something's just so weird fluid? I watched you said like for a the, like the kitchen and bath show, the time I went in there was satin brass and it was kind of like, wow, I haven't seen satin brass. The way I know is the next display the next year has grown. The next display, and now they're selling it, so it means it's selling. Is it too soon? It was at that point high end because it was new. People were like, oh, I want something different. <coughs> we're at the point now that, you know, it's we want change, but gold still sells. It's just a different shading. Yeah. Of, of and the that's gold. what you mentioned, the, the warmth, because you're talking about the warm side of the ballot being important. You watch the, the gold to get warmer, you watch them not so bright and brassy and yellow, you know, you watch them get brown and just get more warm. But and to answer your question also, it's that tracking. Some things hit you and you know because of how much time you spend looking at all this product everywhere in the world, you know that it's something that's a nugget that's going to continue. Other things you're like, make a note of that. And then you watch it, you watch it, and you see if it, if it crests. And then there's other things, I'll use it really weird, but I wanted to make sure I brought this up just because it's the oddest thing. Before COVID, um, and Tom can attest this, we were all, you know, we talked about cottage core for a while, and cottage core is really big because it was about handmade and DIY and slowing down and all of those things that we were just starting to talk about in terms of what we wanted as human beings because we were rushing past everything all the time, and then it started to plateau and go to the opposite side of the curve. You know, everything is sort of like does that right, and when the pandemic hit and we were all forced to slow down, it had a huge resurgence and it had a resurgence among like much younger clients. And so this whole idea of slowing down, we were picnicking, we were biking, we were reading a book and not on a on a Kindle. We were doing all these things. We were, we were baking. Drinking. Every, we were drinking a lot of wine. We were baking a lot of sourdough bread and sending starters to friends. It was all this slowing down and it had a huge resurgence. So you have to, Sometimes you have to pay attention because that doesn't often happen, but every so often it does. And so there are things that you have to track to see if they're coming, you have to track to see if they're waiting, and you have to track to see if they're, you know, coming back around again. It has the timeline of trends changed? I mean, you just mentioned the pandemic yeah. change, but overall, are trends like speeding up? We see them, them slowing down. We see call it evolutions down. rather than revolutions now. They're really things that are subtly moving forward because again, the whole idea is that it's constantly moving. So we see this evolutionary process versus out with the black and in with the gold, <laughs> you know? It really is about this evolution. Um, and some of that certainly is brought in by the, our conversations around sustainability. We're not talking about fast fashion and throwing things out. We're talking about building. We're talking about antiquing, bringing you know older pieces. We're talking about uh, and mixing those in. We're talking about quality and craftsmanship a tremendous amount. So we want things that last. We want things that have the ability, even if we don't pass them down, that they can be passed down. They're not being thrown away. So all of those kinds of things absolutely have to do. I think that's things. very important. And, and one of the things I always notice as a historian is if you look at the past, like Art Deco, or you look at the arts and crafts movement, which was a reaction against mechanization and industrialism, we're in this time now of an enormous shift, of course, with AI. And so there's something really precious about something that has a story. Seeing those, the lighting that mm -hmm. Pet did over oh, yeah, 313 yes. Centennial. If you haven't been that. to 313 Centennial, you'll have to go see this lighting. But it's it's all repurposed. But every culture is represented. Twelve different, twelve years, yes. twelve cultures, and that all was, doing things from lighting exactly. from recycle bottles. It's They're amazing. Cool. It's a and beautiful. And then the story. Project. Did you look at the? Book? I know them. the story of the artists who make these it, it, things. It's so exciting. Yes. And as a human being, I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think we all want that authenticity. Absolutely. And we want something that has. A legacy that we can pass and a warmth. on. It adds a warmth to a yes. space. Anything that's handmade adds that warmth to the space. What it's a story. It's a story. I mean, yeah. it's the creative, like working with you. It, it's the shape and what's a story. And Brian's great about a trend. He gets sales reports, mm -hmm. so he's getting information very quickly to steer things where you could think it's a trend. He's like, it's not selling <laughs> really, and where people are yeah. pushing it that it's supposed to be selling. This is really what's working. So but sometimes, you see, I, I, I'm one of those that I, I push back a little bit because what's selling, a selling report tells you what has sold, but how do you know what's coming? 
You have to always, you can't get so grounded in what has sold. You'll just keep regurgitating the same thing over and over and over again. I but had that conversation. He's basing on what time. whole people are saying is a trend right now. Right, but then the what buyers, are you going to have for the next season? You can't have the same exact thing. Right, oh, but oh, the, buyers coming in, the buyers coming yeah. in thinking they need to buy that. Yeah, but Because that's, that's trending. And he's like, oh, God, it's not selling as well as we thought. I, this is, you just this is what's trending. You still like, need it. He is a little bit ahead. Thing about it, about it, when you too, like too the whole thing you're talking about with handmade, I would, and it sounds very cynical about here, I'm sitting here in the market, but I would rather be with artisans right now than walking around the building mm -hmm. because there's a lot of things that have been regurgitated over the years and it's just, for me as a creative person and a painter, um, I just, uh, I, I need that influence, I need that free flow of Yes, I mean, yes. and, and, and yes, I love, and you know, it's okay, I'll be here, but it's like, I don't. I hope so, they need the lights <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, it's I know. wonderful to have you. <laughs> 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 we need I mean, this is the I'm going on four hours of sleep. <laughs> um, no, it is good, it's, it's nice to be here because I do my, you know, now I can tell everybody now, but I do my walk about uh, like 5.30 to 6 in the building. Because one, other people on the floor knows, they know who I am and so they don't really like for me to be even walking by their showroom, let alone walk in the showroom. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and that's competitiveness. Yeah. That's not anything about, I'm not gonna steal nothing from anybody, but it's just the idea that we all kind of work in the same pool. You know, I see them in the same factories, I see them in the same airports, I see them in the same hotel. You know, it's like everybody's like jockeying to get the next, you know, attention from the factory. But where I get the most energy was when I'm with creative people. The creative people, the artisans that are that are taking a piece of wood and they are making it into a sculpture, a table, uh, a lamp. Uh, they take a piece of a hunk of clay and then suddenly now it's just it's just. 3D imagery face and it's it I am blown away yeah. by that. Yeah. That's the influence I get. That's the I guess the energy. And I, think I just tap yeah, into an energy. And Patty's been doing it for years. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it it's the story. I mean you could go I mm -hmm. could go with you and talk about stuff you design and the story. You know, people could say oh it's a trade that says, well let's talk about even scaling that. Thing, mm -hmm. You know, of what goes into it, it's a story, yeah. and that's what people need to sell it more intimately as well. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I have fun of, of just like yeah. what was the story yeah. of creating it, and it's shocking some of the material in here. Working with them, I'm like, that's what, mm -hmm. and to see what they're making it out of as well to give a look. The it well, was also a bad, bad word to say, imported. You know, and, and I think for a long time people thought, well, it's coming from China, it was lesser quality, you know, it's like all the materials was thrown into a vat and just spits out a mirror. <laughs> and that's just not the way, you know, it's just not the way the world works. And, you know, in India, I don't know where, where it is, you know, it could be Cambodia, or Laos, it doesn't matter where I'm at, but it's like, you don't understand, I think the general public don't understand that there are artisans that are with very, very rudimentary techniques and, and materials and, and, and the capabilities are, are so mind-blowing that they are cranking out these products that I, I, could, I could just spend hours and hours and days and months and years yeah. there. Yeah. Is I there such a thing something. as trends in craftsmanship and oh absolutely oh yeah so absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. it's one of the things we're talking about now we've been certainly focused for a long time on wood right mm -hmm. a long mm -hmm. time on wood yes and mm -hmm. and so the whole as sustainability can you know became top of mind reclaiming recycling upcycling reforestation you know getting things certified so that we could have certain types of woods we went through a big ceramic 
a resurgence, all kinds of ceramics, clays and ceramics from all over the world became very important. Lots of vases, you see them everywhere, um, and all the different techniques for firing them and glazing them and the way they're made all over the world, whether they're high fire or low fire, whether they're buried or put in a kiln, there's all these different ways to create all these wonderful looks and clay. Then the last, the last round for us has been just a huge explosion in how people are working with glass, whether it's hand blown, whether it's slumped, whether it's built, you know, there's all these kinds of things that are happening with glass. And now we see metal as the next sort of frontier we've been calling, you know, it's like forging ahead. We've been talking a great deal about this whole idea that there's a skill set to working with metal. And that we're looking at all, each of these is a craft. You know, stone cutting is a craft, wood carving is a, all these crafts. And for me, the big thing with working with artisans is we, we must do that to keep valuing these products so that these skill sets continue to pass along because otherwise we'll lose them in a generation. If they don't have work, if they can't make right. product, then we will lose the ability to make them in the way that we, we, we value and treasure and have a story behind generations, you know, centuries in some places in terms of how things have been made in a certain way. And with, to your point, rudimentary tools and, and, um, and, and the rawest of materials to come up with some of the most exquisite kinds of products. I just came here from being in the Philippines at their show, Fame, and oh my God, it's a tiny little jewel of a show, but it is, there are generations, you know, of, of, of families that grow rattan, that grow wicker, that grow um, bamboo, that, you know, and different types of woods, and they have passed the skill set for making these things down, and they have such a wonderful group of young designers that are quite innovative because they're not influenced very much by us in the West. I most love going to shows that are going away from Western uh, influences because we are big influencers of what is in the world and when you step outside of our influence someplace like South Africa you know or some place like the Philippines that's really far away they can see it on a phone but it's not the same as the kinds of influences that other countries have from we in the West we mean Europe or the United States um, or North America I should say um, and so when you get beyond our influence and see what their own creativity brings out from their you know hundreds of years sometimes of generations of, of, of workmanship, it's really quite beautiful the kind of, and you see a difference in product. Product design is different, and I love that. I love getting into the methodology mm -hmm. with someone who's an expert, and I also like using regional things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just did a collection for Duke University, and I was able to work with Ben Owen, who's a fifth generation potter here in North Carolina, and now his son, Benjamin, is making pottery, so I bought pieces by Benjamin. Mm -hmm. His wife pots as well, mm -hmm. but Are they part of that they're part of the Sea Grove, the Sea Grove, the grove? The sea grove yeah, which I don't know if you don't know about Sea Grove. It's about an hour from here, not even that far, and there are 116 potters, mm -hmm. and you can't believe the work that they do. It's really spectacular. Got these wood fired kilns yeah. like in the backyard. Exactly. Yeah, and we're going to show you a display. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A few miles away, it's <laughs> Star in North Carolina, and they do glass blowing. Uh -huh. so See, that's there's it. a lot they of those, a lot yeah. of these same methodologies being done locally. So as a designer, I do like helping. Mm -hmm. Me too. Me too. Absolutely. I do think it is, and I do think it inspires <laughs> North American design as well. Yes. There would be to, elements to we up, okay. see and we want to incorporate it into product and other things we're inspired by. Right. Uh, and it could be, you know, simple as it's an unfinished glaze yes. in a certain area right. and yeah. it catches on that way too. Yeah. But it's fascinating that when I'm in a factory and it'll be, you know, it could be China or India and you're not hearing English and you're hearing their dialect and it's going back and forth and back and forth and then suddenly, out of the blue, you hear someone who is either English or French or Italian, and now I understand why they are doing the finishes that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because they're learning from yes. the masters that, are, that we're still doing it, all by hand. And so I think that was what I was trying to say earlier, was that I think we have a tendency to say, oh, it's Chinese made. Well, you know, the Chinese are doing the same techniques that the same artisans in Europe were doing for centuries. Mm -hmm. They just learned it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still blown away by what they're accomplishing. And they're bringing many, I mean, they're even, and even over older civilizations, so they've got so many yes. more techniques that they can yeah. bring to the table that we may or may not be taking advantage of. Yeah, but you yes. mean that we, we're doing something 
not just plugging my stuff here. I have been down in Peru and in a museum, and I'm in. I bring this like, you'll see. But we were working together because I'm taking this. <laughs> What well, Inca, this Inca influence thing on a vacation and trying to make it more contemporary and design it for the you know the Western market and we worked on that and it's I think it's great. It's different. Oh, yeah. it's so there so is an influence mm -hmm. globally of just being in a museum and here's a little picture, you know, that you're like just so inspired by. Can we put in a I think you've all made a great case for timeless design, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also a blend perhaps of what's timeless with a certain mix of what's trending, maybe a little, we only have a few minutes left, but I don't know if there are any retailers in the audience, but I'm curious how, um, really quickly, how you would advise retail buyers in terms of their assortment mix. How do you, what's the blend and what's the, um, what's the percentage of core, timeless, trend, and fad? I don't think any of us are going to say fat. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't put fat, 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 fat in your assortment yeah. necessarily, yeah. depending on the. Well, if you're a small lifestyle store, depending on who your customer base is, you might have be able to pick up on you know little fads that are in there. But I wouldn't. That wouldn't well, focus there. How, how is the retail Ours is always too, sort of. Are they right. trend like 10, yeah. 10, 20, 70. You know, you have your core products. We always say the sizzle that sells a steak. So you need those fan, those special pieces because that brings you a point of differentiation from everybody else that's out there. So you should have something that speaks to your aesthetic, that speaks to your brand's DNA, that separates you from everything else Partners that's out there. Brand. Exactly, that's gonna be the story that you're telling to your customer. Then yeah. you need some that are pushing for those ones, as I said, those early adopters. So there's, to me, we, we used to do them as the oh, fat, fat, fashion, or the Fs. Well, I know one of them. <laughs> no, no, not that one. No, no, oh, Brian, I was asking you because we oh, had the Fs. What's an F? What was it? The ten Piece. No, not the ten Piece, but there were three things. So, I forgot. Them. Yeah, <laughs> but it was, it was basically, I mean, it, it's still different companies I worked in use those different phrases, but Sizzle itself a steak was one of them. But it's this idea that, you know, the largest por portion of your, your assortment should be the things that you know based on your selling reports that sell. Mm -hmm. But they shouldn't be only that. So to us, it's like somewhere between 60, 70, and then depending on how much you have on that earlier um, adoption, you can make that your 20, 30, and then a 10% of those things that are just, you're testing, you're playing, you're showing things that really show off your DNA in your in your retail space uh, that makes basic, you different. Basic fashion Thank you. And fashion. Thank you. See? <laughs> basic, basic fashion and fashion. That was what I said. So your basic is your core, yeah. your basic fashion core with some twists, and then your fashion is that thing that pushes it over the edge. And Christopher, when you're designing, do you have a similar formula for your clients? I know you it's really it's been interesting to learn what what the buyer is doing and then like i said i'm doing lighting i want to do copper well is it too forward to do a huge quantity or if we're testing it like the 10 percent as an accent and see the reaction uh -huh. and so we're doing that with different finishes to test it because you, like i said you don't want to be too far forward because a showroom is sitting on the shelf and a retailer doesn't want it sitting on the shelf it's money on the shelf right so how is a way to take what we know and start playing with different elements. That it becomes basic fashion. There's a, a one of the Fs. Yeah. It's friendly fashion forward. That's yeah. a lot of Fs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we only have two minutes left. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Oh, Ellie, I'm 74 questions. 74 questions. <laughs> um, you're, you're, you're all agreed on the fact that the story is super important. Um, and I agree. Uh, and Christopher, your experience is, is such that you get to speak to people you could you could sell or attend to a Filipino. So, you know, I mean, you are actually talking to people, and so you're how how do how do retailers how do how do even manufacturers somebody walks into the showroom and you have no you can't tell the story to everybody. How do you keep the story with the product? That's a good question. <laughs> so, like, Did you all hear the question? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> How do you keep the story with the product? Well, well I think I have be, my own. well, I think because we have somebody that is our part of our marketing team that you know 
pushes me to express myself and to tell the whole story and I'm so used to keeping everything in my own head and then you know now that I'm having to do that uh, she is Brie is getting that out there and she's keeping that smack in front of everybody and using the same thing that I just knocked a minute ago about social media. <laughs> but hey, there is an upside to everything. I, and I have an idea. You know? I, I have an idea. People see any video and they just stop, you know. And so maybe the video is telling the story. It doesn't take up a lot of real estate. So if you have a collection like here again, yeah. showing how it's made, what's going into it, who's an artist, to absorb the story and take away sound bites is one way I would do it because you can't stop and talk to everybody, but they can sit and watch something and there's a byline or yeah. well, information we, about we it. We learned that we were, were putting, I don't know, you guys probably saw this before, but we were putting the little stories in little acrylic signs and putting them everywhere. And the more that we did that, the more that everything kind of grew with its story. And then it just became, okay, well, I don't even have any room on that shelf for the product. I mean, <laughs> but I have acrylic signs that will say everything. <laughs> so, yeah, we had to limit that down. But, you know, I think that it, it, I think it goes back to just personalities. I mean, you, we all have to kind of, when we're here, talk to each other and, and be personable. And not everybody wants to hear my story. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, I'll, listen, I'll talk to anybody. Yeah, you know, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that keeping it out there, I mean, that social media, that up to date things like that are, are very important. Um, you know, the fact that we do not do print catalogs anymore, you know, we do digital, well, well, um, and that's yeah. in that catalog too. Yeah, it's in but the... you know, well, I'm from the era where you walk, I mean, I had a lot of people that back then that would carry just suitcases, big suitcases. Mm -hmm. Just to collect all oh, the catalogs. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. just them. you just yeah. loved them. I couldn't wait to get home and listen to my catalogs. Uh, you know, yeah. that's just doesn't happen anymore. But it yes, was but more, the catalog is more efficient. Yes, I'm watching my employee click, go back, click, go back, yes, click, and exactly. a catalog. Yeah, there's a bit, yellow yeah. sticky, yeah. yellow yeah. sticky. Yeah. We're but done. it's not sustainable. But no, I'm going to say there's other ways wait, to do it. Wait, hold on. I've got to speak to that. Well, my person prints out 12 pages oh, with geez. a review. So you get and it's like, anyway. uh, this oh, well, wasn't anyway. sustainable. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing I was going to say is another way to tell stories, and especially at the retail level, and I'm finding it, I'm seeing it more and more as I move around trade shows around the world. More and more people are bringing artisans in and having in them their spaces to show you how something's made so that you understand the technique, that you understand the time, you understand the skill, the craftspersonship that goes into it. Even over at some place like 313, Brian just did some block printing on Friday because there's a beautiful Indian company over there that does block printed textiles and they have all these beautiful little block prints and lots of paint and they, you can stand there and do it and you realize if I'm looking at a tablecloth that has this much on it, how long did it take somebody who knew what they were doing to stand there and do that? And so it brings a different kind of appreciation for product, a different kind of appreciation for skill set. Um, certainly we've seen lots of weavers. Everywhere you go now, you see weavers. But I saw people working with bending rattan and things in the booth when I was in the Philippines at Maison. They always have, they had people making chairs. You know, you were literally watching the woodworkers do the chair, bending the chairs or upholstering. All of those things are great and it, they're wonderful for the interior designers too because you could use that that information that language when you're selling your clients for them to understand the difference between this thing and that thing and why you've put this in front of them as something that's uh, particularly every, investment exactly well, I just wanted to say that's that's a superior piece to another because they really you have the experience and the expertise it separates you from them googling it and finding it on all you know whatever the particular platform happens to be but it also gives you know you need that knowledge as well all of of us need that knowledge to be able to pass on to our consumers. Well, and Patty, yeah. that, that Maison J, yes. everything is QR code now, right? Oh, yeah. And that's something that can translate to a consumer. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you put a small QR code on, on, on a anything, label, you can on tell the, the story. Trace, I can know everything about mm -hmm. it. Right. When I'm selling see it, that when I'm like going. And a lot more. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. And for the end consumer, this is a story that they tell. They want, yeah. That this is something they're Exactly. Talking. When so it's so in I their home, when it's on their table and they're having people for dinner, they tell the story of either the table or the yep. piece you're eating off of or the textile you have. People mm -hmm. love, I mean, my whole house, all my friends say my house is a museum. That's Everything a I have idea. has a story. A story. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. yeah, I just, I, don't, I, like, I like that. And so, and more and more people are like that yeah. in terms of that.
So that's it. That's a great, the QR code's a great way. Mm -hmm. I just think we're really challenged to get to the end consumer, whether you're a retailer or whether you're an interior designer. Mm -hmm. How do you get to the person who's going to own it? Because the busiest times, if you're a retailer, or the, when you're really busy with a client, you've got, you don't have the time. Mm -hmm. so, and I, you know, and you've I, got temporary people. Who right. I love the consumer can immediately get a story themselves. It's not uh, labor yeah. and time and mm -hmm. yeah. forget my video. No, from no my design. video is still No, video is still important. No, lots of people the have The videos, videos are going to be very important they because are really what our big push is, is that, you know, we don't see crowds at shows as much as we used to. And, you know, people are using other media to try to understand or order uh, product that Part of what Christopher is saying is the video part of it. It's like how it, uh, those products are made. And so if we yes. could do that in a format where the, you in the, in the retail store could say, hey, watch this video because this is how this vase or this piece was made. That's now that story could be told for them, but now you've got the backup and you could say, okay, I was so excited to see that. Mm -hmm. If my excitement that I see can be passed on and it can be translated in some type of format, whether it be videos or it's stories or you know uh, taking close-ups and, and videos of product. I mean, any. I am so open to all of that because as I've seen it over the last 32 years, I've seen less and less people come to market mm -hmm. and they're utilizing other formats. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I want the experience of you guys being here to be for everybody. Yeah. Cause you could pick up a mirror, you could touch it, you could feel it, you could understand the story, you, you could see the video, it, but I want you to be able to do that if you're not here. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big challenge moving forward for all of us. I think so. yeah. I think that's all we have time for. Keep an eye out for those key work. Thank you all so much, Christopher. Have a drink.